The opening of the exhibition, Tadeusz Kantor Spectres, coincides with the 105th anniversary of Tadeusz Kantor's birth and with the 30th anniversary of his death. Recall those other momentous anniversaries, uh, the 5th, the 10th, the 15th, the 20th, the 25th, and the different pathways they offered about thinking about Kantor's as a theater and visual artist. Through conferences, lectures, and exhibitions, we have explored Cantor's avant-garde performance practices in the 20th century, new critical and theoretical approaches to Cantor's theater as visual artist, history, tradition, memory, myth, death, and the everyday in Cantor's theater of personal confessions, space and objects in Cantor's theater experiments, Cantor's autonomous, informal, zero happening or impossible theaters, or offered new critical appraisal of Cantor's theater of memory and mnemotechnics. The list is inexhaustible. What is it in Cantor's theater that fascinates us today and prompts relentless returns to his practice and theoretical writings? Cantor started to paint and stage plays during the modernist revolution, which had been instigated by the first wave avant-garde in France, the Soviet Union and Poland in the 1920s and 30s. Like the Dadaists, the Constructivists and the Surrealists, he believed, quote, everything I have done in art so far has been the reflection of my attitude towards the events that surrounded me towards the situation in which I have lived, of my fears, of my faith in this and not something else, of my distrust in what was to be trusted, of my skepticism, my hope. Cantor's experiments with informal art, embellages and the happenings took place in the 1950s, 1960s and the 1970s, that is, at the time of the post-war European and American second wave avant-garde questioning the modernist revolution. Quote, the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s have passed. Artistic ideas have been breaking the surface. However, all the time, as if from far beyond, maybe it was my inner voice, I have been perceiving warning signals that ordered me and dictated that I choose one action over the other protest, revolt against the officially recognized sacred sites, against everything that had a stamp of approval for realness, for poverty. His most widely known productions outside of Poland, uh, The Dead Class, 1975, Vila Vola, Vila Pole, 1980, Let the Artist Die, 1985, I Shall Never Return, 1988, and Today's My Birthday, 1990, coexisted with diverse forms of postmodern art and theater, as well as critical theory of Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida, and Gilles Deleuze. Quote, my productions, The Dead Class, Villopole, Villopole, Let the Artist Die, and this last one, I Shall Never Return, all of them are personal confessions. Thus, Tadeusz Kantor, a high modernist by birth and practice, was engaged in the process of revising the dicta of modernism in the postmodern world surrounding him, intending to perturb the existing order of things. Even though it would be difficult to frame Kantor as postmodern, his praxis defined the very mode of postmodern operation and many of its theoretical concepts, such as anamnesis, that elaborates an initial forgetting, heterotopia, that is a countersite to the real site, in which the rules of the real sites are recognized, contested, and reversed, chirological time, that liberates a human being from servitude to continuous linear time, or a process of deterritorialization of representation that challenges official art and mass culture. Today, new narratives are woven, this time by critics who have never saw his theater practice, but instead work with his oeuvre house at the Krekoteka. From the beginning in the 1980s, Krekoteka needed to define its identity among those other Kantorian objects and things, 
alongside his room of imagination, objects range from life and war reality, a cafe, a street, a laundrette, or a cloakroom, which marked the contours of the map drawn by Cantor. In time, new artistic configurations appeared in Cantor's artistic journey. However, he had always remained faithful to his attitude of nonconformity and the incessant need to revise his thinking about the theater praxis. He kept writing, editing, revising, as well as proposing new ideas, which like his thoughts, populated his room of imagination. Quote, behind the doors, a storm and an inferno rage, and the waters of the flood raise. The weak walls of our room will not save us. Important events stand behind the doors. It is enough to open them. It is enough to open the doors to enter the place, revealing the traces of transition from that other side into our world. His notes, drawings, theoretical writings, photographs, objects, bio-objects, reviews and recordings of his theater productions and his paintings. This collection, like a library collection in one of Borges's short stories, comprises an infinite number of objects. Today, we organize and reorganize them in various ways in order to give testimony to Cantor's artistic endeavors and those of the Krikotu theater. Memory and transmission, two key words that keep stubbornly returning in Cantor's theoretical writings, define explicitly the function Krikoteka was to perform. Let me quote Cantor himself on the subject. First, quote, the archive, a life, not a library collection, not a collection of old and dead costumes, dead props, sentimental memories, and dried out memorabilia, as it's usually the case, but a collection of ideas which were born in opposition to everything surrounding them. And one more text. At the moment of encountering a work of art, a human being sees an object which is enclosed in itself without any connection to life and which exists independently of us. We enter the sphere of the unknown and the unexplainable. These truths became known to me thanks to the art of the 20th century, which required that the shape and the function of the museum be redefined. The possibility of being able to perceive the essential attributes of a work of art as an object emitting a distinct energy requires that a suitable space be created, which is designed in such a way as to allow the object reflect these waves of energy and transmit them to the spectators. The triad, a work of art, space, spectator, has to create a new undivided whole where these three elements will create a new work of art and a new museum. Indeed, in the context of this exhibition, Tadeusz Kantor's Spectres, how are we to think about a work of art in 2020? How are we to think about space today? How are we to think about a spectator in the digital and social media age? Do Cantor's statements from the end of the 20th century, despite what he said, have any relevance for us in the 21st century, or are they to be safely stored in the archive? As he implied in a statement made shortly before his death, quote, his life and his destiny have always identified themselves with his works of art, a work of art. They have always realized themselves in his work. They have always found their solution in it. His home has always been and is his work, a painting, a performance, a theater, a stage. These four elements, however, could never be treated as stable reference points mapping out the landscape of his life because they were given different shapes and meaning depending on the pressures of the historical, cultural, and ideological networks of relations within which he found himself positioned. Thus, a painting could be a metamorphosis, a collage, 
a decollage, Latin for male, an abstraction, a figurative art, or an object. A performance could be a reality of the lowest rank, an informel, an embellage, a happening, an impossible theater, a memory machine, or a found reality. A theater and a stage could be a real space, a room of memory, a cemetery storeroom, or a room of imagination. These shape shifters intrigue us. More than that, these Fidgeting semblances of Cantor's imagination, Cantor's theater experiments in the Cuttlefish, 1956, The Country House, 1961, Madman and the Nun, 1963, The Water Hand, 1967, and Deity Shapes or Harry Apes, 1973, that is his autonomous, informel, zero, happening, and impossible theaters, perturbed the order or a system of interpretation. Existing on the edges of discourse or in its grifts and crannies, they depreciated the value of reality by exploring its unknown, thus far hidden or censored aspects, marginalized objects, degraded objects, or self-enclosed actions that the culture or political apparatuses could not co-opt, appropriate, deform, and could only shelve them as irrelevant. Today, while watching this heap of objects piled up in the exhibition space at the Krikoteka, and while listening to the words describing the fragments of his life, finding their fate and destiny in the reality of the lowest strength, we realize that there is something disturbing in Cantor's discourse. These fragments and objects not only mark the stages in the history of the Krikotu theater, but are the punctum in representational reality. They are antithetical to life, and that is why they are scandalous and shocking when defined in terms of its categories, says Cantor. We listen to his and their protest against being accepted by the bourgeois aesthetics, swallowed up by the artistic trends and systematized into orders. Forms manly intermingled, whirling, crisscrossing each other, one atop the other like ants in their nest. Like Benjaminian collector, Cantor lived and walked around these objects in order to reveal their state of unrest in his performative constellation. In lesson one of the Milano lessons, Cantor noted, quote, 1944, Krakow, clandestine theater, the return of Odysseus from the siege of Stalingrad. Abstraction which existed in Poland until the outbreak of World War II disappeared in the period of mass genocide. This is a common phenomenon. Bestiality brought to the fore by this war was too alien to this pure idea. Realness was stronger. Also, any attempt to go beyond it came to naught. The work of art lost its power. Aesthetic reproduction lost its power. The anger of a human being trapped by other human beasts cursed art. We had only the strength to grab the nearest thing, the real object, and call it a work of art. Yet it was a poor object unable to perform any function in life, an object about to be discarded, an object which was bereft of a life function that would save it, an object which was stripped, functionless. The objects which were unable to perform any function in life or just about to be discarded were brought in not onto the stage, but into a room which like them, was no longer functional, Cantor notes. There was war and there were thousands of such rooms. They all looked alike. Bare bricks stared behind a coat of paint. Plaster was hanging from the ceiling. Boards were missing in the floor. Abandoned parcels were covered with dust. Debris was scattered around. It was the time of the Nazi occupation in Krakow. Artistic activity was antithetical to the idea of cultural development. More important, for Cantor, this space of a room was antithetical to life. 
It was antithetical to life because the war destroyed its signifying features, affirming life and its ability to represent the human condition. Into this room, the performers brought in the objects found in the war zone, a cartwheel smeared with mud, a decayed wooden board, a scaffold spattered with plaster, a decrepit loudspeaker rending the air with screeching war announcements, and a kitchen chair. These objects, the tropes of the war reality, which stripped them of their daily purpose, lost their power and value, and value that was assigned to them by life. Thus, when it was, they were brought into the room where the return of Odysseus was shown, this object was empty, as Cantor says. It had to justify its beginning and its being to itself rather than to the surroundings which were foreign to it. By so doing, the object revealed its own existence. In the return of Odysseus, Penelope, sitting on a kitchen chair, performed the act of being seated as a human act happening for the first time. The physical object acquired its historical, philosophical, and artistic function. While confronting us with Penelope sitting in a chair in the 1944 production of The Return of Odysseus, Cantor seemed to suggest that while the war was raging, one needed to abandon the contemplative attitude towards the object. Compare this attitude with the theory behind the suprematist compositions of Kazimir Malevich and Piet Mondrian in order to become conscious of the state of unrest and the critical constellation in which precisely this fragment of the past find itself in precisely that moment. The chair, the object in a room marked by World War II, exploded the epoch out of its reified historical continuity. The event itself was momentous. It was only grasped as living present in bodies and objects which acted and were acted upon. Bereft of their pre-assigned identities, these objects needed now to name themselves in the act happening in precisely this present, revealing the fissures and cracks in the dominant understanding of time and history. A modified version of history whose side is not homogeneous, empty time, but time filled by the presence of the now as Walter Benjamin would have it. The uncompromising radicalism of this work refused to play along with or represent the culture that gave birth to murder or with the realm where genocide has already become part of heritage. The uncompromising radicalism of this work drew attention to the process of unsettling temporality which lets the object slip away from both the imperious presence of the metaphysical and the presence of the regulated historical time. Consequently, the return of Odysseus so poignantly made clear that the objects could be formed freely in history if the resources embedded in the object were released to reveal its internal contradictions to reveal its objectness, denied by the established state of affairs or historical status quo. A lesson worth remembering. After the war in 1947, Cantor wrote, quote, while I was in Warsaw, I saw a piece of an iron bridge which must have been hit by a bomb. I was struck by the sight of this incredible compression. I had a shocking sensation of the force which had done it, unimaginable as a human force. A thought crossed my mind that if someone, a joker, plays this piece of iron as a monument on a public square, in the future, the historians would in its entangled form decipher the forces which governed our time. I also had a thought that this incredible compressed form could herald the artistic conventions of the post-war aesthetics. This piece of an iron bridge, which was destroyed by the war, 
Unlike the objects from the 1944 production of The Return of Odysseus revealed in its wreckage the forces that governed Cantor's time. Indeed, the world is contained in the object, as Benjamin would have it. For Cantor, this bridge hit by a bomb was a reminder of that civilization and power regimes that had rationalized the existence of the willing executioners who turned human bodies into soap, ashes, and smoke in Auschwitz. Of that material object, which existing on the edges of discourse, contests the forces that govern his time, as well as reveal the complexities of the modern world and of the new social reality. Cantor's materialization of an object bring to mind Jean-Francois Léotard's statement in Music Mutic that, quote, the art of the work of art is always a gesture of space, time, matter. The art of the musical score, a gesture of space, time, sound. This gesture is not a semantic or ethnographic sign operating with a particular, within particular culture or an, an emphatic movement of the body. Neither is it a Brechtian gestus covering particular social attitudes adopted by the spectator towards other people. This gesture is the expression uh, and the exploration of the attributes of the object, the exploration of the object's objectness, to use Cantor's phrase. This object's objectness is matter which is located in space and time. However, space and time are no longer Newtonian stable categories, but to paraphrase Albert Einstein, modes of thinking shaped by contingencies of historical materialism. The emotive power of objects is established not in terms of absolute categories, but in terms of their relation to other objects in the space of representation, which is delimited by the observable phenomena of a specifiable historical reality. They are in it, but not necessarily of it. They are located within the observable and sonorous space, but as was the case with the objects brought into a performance space in the return of Odysseus, they are not defined by the use value assigned to them by a convention, a pre-war politics or ideology. In establishing their relationship to other objects in the field, the use value is questioned in the process of revealing the forces which governed our time and the traces of matter which was glossed over by a convention naming the object so that it became visible as a product of an aestheticized reproduction. Thus Cantor's objects a gesture of a specific space-time matter, crowded performance space. Whether it was a wardrobe, a funeral machine, or a junk pram from the country house, an annihilation machine built of folding chairs and preventing the actors from playing their parts in the Madman and the Nun, the school desks, a bio-object ruthlessly generating all human conditions and emotions in the dead class, or the room which was destroyed multiple times by the intrusion of the people and historical events from behind the doors in Vilopole Vilopole and in today's my birthday. These objects, like the chair in the return of Odysseus and a piece of an iron bridge, illuminate the consciousness of the present, which explodes the continuum of mainstream history. Cantor's impulse to collect and to archive objects which ruptured the smooth surface of cultural and historical conditions and the praxis of deciphering from these objects the forces that governed their and our epoch challenge the spectator. These objects perturb our gaze only if their meaning is neither awaited nor anticipated if we are open to their unexpected presence in space, the landscape of the possible. Do we have the courage to listen to Cantor's voice 
in that other world beyond the confines of our aesthetics of indifference or the need for the conventions privileging harmony. For us, this heap of images and objects of the 20th century is transformed into sonorous linguistic and visual effects to be seen in theaters and museum spaces. For him, this heap of images and objects made him walk into the empty night. Will we fall asleep tonight? Will we wake in the middle? Will we stare at the ceiling with sightless eyes? The sightless eyes stare at those who understood the consequences of the processes and the procedures of turning artistic practice into a reified form by the culture industry. Counter notes. Holy technology rules every day today in theaters, mass media, and television. It produces this surrealistic enchantment by the thousands. There was a reason Cantor talked frequently about constructivism, Dada, surrealism, and their techniques of protest, mutiny, and negation, manifestic forms that were freed from the strict laws of construction and were always changing and fluid, negating, decomposing, dissolving, deconstructing, or destroying a promise of representation. Quote, Today, in the dilapidated world dominated by the civilization of universal consumerism, in the times when the spirit of bourgeois pragmatism reemerges in our civilization, it is imperative that the constructivist lesson be remembered and that their goals, which they might not have fully realized, be finally perceived. For him, the constructivists believed that artistic revolution was parallel to a social revolution in the Soviet Union in the 1920s, that art had the capacity to inject into life's fabric justice and equa equ equity, that is, that which is, did not yet or could not be seen and was in the process of becoming. To accomplish this goal, the constructivists promoted and disseminated the ideas of the revolution and of the new art using the tools that were alien to the bourgeoisie and its two century long aesthetics. Lyubov Popova's constructivism and its emphasis on spatial structures exhibiting their industrial function was to have been an expression of the dynamics of modernity, avant-garde technology, and sought to create a new artistic space complementing a revolutionary situation. Cantor's objects wrenched away from the war reality. Matter, marginalized objects, degraded objects, stood in opposition to classical beauty. His was not a manifestation of an avant-garde rebellion against the tradition or antiquated aesthetic categories. The time of the war and the time of the lords of the world made him abandon the sacred icon behind which a beast was hiding, and with it a model of culture or artistic activity which was based on transformation of reality or an object into an image shaped by an aesthetic convention. In its stead, Cantor offered a praxis which troubled the recognized reality by bringing to the fore its hitherto dismissed or illegitimate aspects. Cantor by no means represented or deformed reality, the real of the everyday. Reality was taken up, annexed. Both it and its content were, rev were viewed as fully formed ready-mates. Cantor annexed reality in order to dislocate the existing aesthetic configurations by subjecting objects to the disinterested and repetitive operations, by liberating them from the bondage of moral or aesthetic utility. The logic of activating that which is repressed in the object or subject framed Cantor's happenings in the period between 1965 and 1969. Krikotash, December 10, 1965. A demarcation line, December 18, 1965. A grand emballage, October 20th, 
1966. A letter, January 12th, 1967. A panoramic sea happening, August 23rd, 1967. Homage to Maria Rema, October 30th, 1968. A winter assemblage, January 18th, 1969. And a lesson according to Rembrandt, January 24th, 1969. Though linked conceptually to the happenings in the West, they were grounded in, as well as were an extension of Cantor's understanding of the reality of the lowest rank, an object and its objectness, matter, space, avant-garde movements of the 20th century, and especially Dada and Surrealism. Quote, in my treatment of the water hand, I have tried to avoid an unnecessary construction of elements. I have introduced into it not only objects, but also their characteristics and ready-made events which were already molded. Thus my intervention was dispensable. An object ought to be won over and possessed rather than depicted or shown. What a marvelous difference. Important and unimportant, mundane, boring, conventional events and situations constitute the heart of reality. I derail them from the track of realness give them autonomy, which in life is called aimlessness, and deprive them of any motivation and effects. I keep turning them around, recreate them indefinitely until they begin to have a life of their own, until they begin to fascinate us. Does an object existing in its own medium, derailed from the track of aesthetics or realness, was autonomous? a non-conceptual objects in Adornian sense. Quote, the principle that governs autonomous works of art is not the totality of their effects, but their inherent structure. They are knowledge as non-conceptual objects. This is the source of their greatness. Cantor's non-conceptual objects, derailed from the tract of commodified aesthetics, revealed their unstriated multiplicity and demanded that we confront the reified residues of culture in them. In, for example, Cricotage, 14 everyday actions, sitting, eating, shaving, talking on the phone, carrying buckets with coal for heating, moving objects, bereft of the cause and effect pattern of development and closed upon themselves, sentenced to developing in isolation and taking place simultaneously, gained their autonomy and realness in 45 minutes. This autonomy and realness was the actual force of resistance to any representational form affirming life which was irrevocably damaged by the time of the war and the time of the lords of the war. Quote, a long time ago, I was fascinated by the Atlantis disaster, by the world before our world, by the only known report about it by Plato and by Plato's opening words that night. Then everything started anew and out of nothing. Even though these words describe the opening of the silent night, they could be used to describe Cantor's lifelong resistance to any representational form affirming life. Quote, now then here on this stage, the end of the world, after a disaster, a heap of dead bodies, there are many of them, a heap of broken objects. This is all that is left. Then according to the principles of my theater, the dead come to life, and play their parts as if nothing happened. Cantor's world after the disaster is like an emergence of another world happening inside a narrative, performative, or sonorous landscape. This was true in his theater experiments between 1944 and 1973, as well in his productions, The Dead Class, Villa Pole, Villa Pole, Let the Artist Die, I Shall Never Return, and Today's My Birthday, which Cantor cataloged as the theater of personal confessions. What are these personal confessions? In the dead class, these were Cantor's obsessions, World War I, World War II, Nazi power, his own memories of the past. In Villopole, Villopole, the inhabitants of his room of memory allowed Cantor to explore his thoughts about life and death 
about his family and the events of World War II, as well as about Christianity and Judaism. Let the Artist Die addressed the condition of an artist in contemporary society. The negatives of his private life, history, and art converged and diverged in order to reveal the landscape where Cantor staged his battle against official history. His individual life was set against the consumerism of the world, even at the price of, as Cantor noted, pain, suffering, despair, and the shame, humiliation, derision. In I Shall Never Return, a poor and suspicious inn, somewhere on forgotten street of dreams, a new version of Cantor's room of imagination was filled with objects and people who kept emerging, disappearing, and re-emerging at different stages of Cantor's life and history to give the testimony to the generation that witnessed genocide and the terrorist attacks on art and culture. The historical fragments of the past and the shreds of artistic and personal memories, Cantor's ready-made objects are transformed into the ground emballage of the end of the 20th century in order to save these fragments from oblivion. In today's My Birthday, the space between the frames became the focal point of the discourse where diverse traces of past artistic representations, private recollections, accidental events, and historical narratives came to life to claim some degree of reality before they dissipated into the space of unregulated relationships. The irrepressible chaos was beyond becoming a framed singular narrative about the staging of difficult past or difficult heritage. Cantor's theater was, as he contended, not a representation of, but an answer to reality. His objects of the reality of the lowest rank and his theater of personal confession help him explore the fissures and cracks in national mnemotechnics offering then and today a critique of the politics of historical amnesia in Poland at the time of the growing nationalism and populism. To think about Cantor's theater practice, on the eve of the 30th anniversary of his death, is to think about the shattering force revitalizing his historical remnants and objects to reveal that indeed they have their own history other than the one superimposed upon them by the discredited metaphysics and history of the 20th century. Looking at these objects amassed in the exhibition space, one becomes aware that it is not the archival accumulation of the traces of history in these objects that matters. Rather, these objects cancel their original function and are transformed into messages of protest. They are saturated with the experience of a world and as such identify their complex multi-layered history. Cantor never cut himself off from the world, but staged the battle for life and death in his poor room of imagination. Quote, against half human creatures stands a human being. It is only in this individual human life that truth, divinity, and grandeur were preserved. They should be saved from destruction and oblivion saved from all powers of the world, despite the awareness of impending failure. Maybe this last thought, a call for action, despite the awareness of impending failure, is a radical gesture in Cantor's theater of personal confessions, addressing the riddle of humanity as a dialectical image. All there is, is the state of unrest, and the resistance to the status quo. Cantor's personal confessions visualized on stage an anamnesis that elaborates initial forgetting that freedom of art is a gift neither from the politicians nor the authorities. Cantor's hollowed out objects, a chair, a piece of the iron bridge, school desk, crosses, bio objects, human embellage, a photograph, and the imprints impressed deeply in the immemorial past, or his room of imagination, 
will always be his protest against the official history, his critique of a conformist logic and of the established system of life, which denies its own promises. Cantor's hollowed out objects break away from experience of a world which the unreasonable or where the unreasonable becomes part of the cultural heritage. Resisting the laws which gave them intelligibility, these objects are no longer gathered into a coherent landscape, but are scattered around in the space. Cantor does not bring them about into harmonious synthesis to spotlight therapeutic alternatives and an empowering ending. Today, we might see them as useless objects, which indeed lost their function in life, but not their past, a tragic past, a lesson worth remembering. The world of this exhibition is the world after a disaster materialized here as a heap of scattered objects which used to exist. Beginning to live here again, they revealed the cracks in our world and in this museum space. Bringing Cantor's difficult past back to life, we are asking questions about the uncertain future. In this museum space, different ideas from a, form a special narrative in which these objects, costumes, archive, fragments, thus Cantor's shreds and pieces of the past create a palpable network of tensions between them. These forms madly intermingled, whirling and crisscrossing, as well as the tensions created by a thick layer of objects and costumes from Cantor's past productions, create a spatial landscape after a disaster. The meanings and shapes are stacked and repeated. They unsettle and disturb linear temporality. We can look at these objects and costumes from a safe distance. We can see how compressed they are and in their entangled forms begin to decipher the forces which govern our time to return to counter statements from 1947. The spine of this exhibition is a wooden walkway which enables the audience to move between the various groups of objects in a non-chronological manner. The walkway is a gesture towards Cantor's unrealized idea, which he wanted to employ in the Kirkpotus production of Let the Artist Die and Today's My Birthday. The walkway was to have functioned as a runway for the actors. Cantor wanted to reverse the perceptual order, the theatrical objects audience watching the actors. Repeating this idea now, we are confronting the audience with a similar situation, the object watching the visitors on the walkway. The objects demand attention and response. Rather than adhering to its traditional functions of presenting and documenting the objects, this exhibition is an active environment seducing and entrapping the audience in a multi-layered circulation of matter in which they are one of the components. The audience, Albert Cantor, holds a full responsibility for the act of entering the theater. A triad, a work of art space spectator, has to create a new undivided hall where these three elements will create a new work of art and a new museum is indeed Cantor's gauntlet thrown to us all, museum staff, scholars and critics, as well as theater practitioners and the people who have never seen the productions of the Cricot to Theater and Cantor's artwork. Important events stand behind the doors. It is enough to open them. Thank you. <laughs>